All right. Well, welcome everybody to the Southwest Park and Recreation Training Institute, Park Planning and Maintenance Academy on Zoom this year. Last year we would have been, I mean, last week we would have been doing it live. And I'm really bummed that we didn't get to do it live in Aurora, Colorado, but I'm glad to have all of you joining us today. Um, for those of you uh, who um, are on today, you should have gotten in the email I sent you the handout that Dr. Cranshaw did for us today. And that was attached to your email, if you didn't notice it at the bottom. But that's to help you sort of follow along today and to have, um, you know, not have to take notes so much today. So hopefully that is helpful to all of you. Um, also want to sort of let you know, for those of you who do not know the Southwest Park and Recreation Training Institute, uh, we are an organization that has been around for over 65 years. We have our annual conference in February in Oklahoma, out on the peninsula of Fort Gibson Lake. It's a really beautiful area. And the Park Planning and Maintenance Academy is a sub education opportunity out of Southwest. So we are under the umbrella of Southwest. And that is how we have come to be. Uh, we do not stand alone. And um, next year, hopefully, we are live in Aurora again, August the 2nd through the 5th. For the past three years, we've always been the first week of, of August. And it's in person and touring and all kinds of fun stuff that we do. So I want to now thank our sponsors that have stood by us through this craziness and have been with us for the first three years of PPMA. Uh, that is L.L. Johnson, and some of you may know Dan Melquire, who has been a longtime supporter of a lot of park and recreation education. Along with Pro Professional Turf Products and Toro, we have Mr. Paul Reed from Rainbird, who uh, joined us this year for the first time. And then Edwin Arcio from Musco Lighting. And I wanna make sure you know who they are because we would not be doing this without them. So thank you to all of our sponsors. So I am going to now stop sharing my screen and we're going to bring up Dr. Whitney Cranshaw. And let me also remind you that if you have questions for us today, you're gonna use the chat feature, which is down across the bottom of your screen to ask your questions. Um, he and I both will be able to see those and then we will field those questions at the end and we'll go as long as you wanna stay on and he can stay on. Um, so I would like to introduce you to him. Uh, he is a legend and has been a legend at Colorado State University. He has been a professor and an extension specialist in entomology for 37 years. He just retired on July 31st but he is not sitting still by any means. He has produced over 95 publications concerning arthropod pests affecting horticulture commodities, including vegetables, shade trees, turf grass, and specialty crops. He has several books to his credit as well, including The Guide to Colorado Insects, Bugs Rule, An Introduction to the World of Insects, and the second edition of The Garden Insects of North America. So Whitney, you may pull up your screen. Okay, I, you can't, can you see it? Not yet. Uh-oh. So do, right. do that share screen down there. All right. Uh -huh. There you go. Now okay. it's coming in. There you go. Excellent. Okay, ready to rumble? Ready to rumble. I'm gonna mute and disappear but i will come back at the end and we will do the questions and i'll do the the closing and everything so i'll see you in a little while thank you for being here yep okay so this is a topic i like i like to talk about and some of it's uh you've probably heard of but i hope i'll give you a different angle and uh want to show lots of pictures so that handout uh, will help you here so the idea here is that uh 
the kinds of things you plant in your park or wherever, your yard, uh, can have influences on all sorts of kinds of insects. So some of them might be desirable things uh, and some of them might be pests. Uh, and the kinds of things that a garden planting could affect would be, you know, butterflies or hummingbird moths or certain kinds of bugs that come into houses. Um, lots of things. And I'm going to talk just about a couple of these, uh, mostly emphasizing the ones that are perceived as being the desirable, beneficial kinds of animals. And this is the handout that I hope you will get. And it, it, it restates a lot of what I'm gonna say, so you don't have to take notes. Um, and I'll show you my email at the end of all this so you can get in touch with me if there's something that's not clear. Plus we'll have some time to share. Yeah. So, so basically, when I think of how to landscape for insects, uh, uh, I, I try to think of, you know, what do they need? Uh, what's, what, what do they need? You know, bugs, you know, bugs are people too. Not exactly, but you know they have needs. Uh, they're going to have a certain kind of need for when they're growing up. They're going to have a certain kind of need for when they're an adult that might be different. Maybe they need shelter. Not all of them need shelter, but so, for example, uh, food for the young. You know, it might be when we talk about uh, uh, butterflies or moths, the the caterpillar stage is feeding on some kind of plant. And if you want the adults, you have to have the uh, young before that. Uh, Food needs for the adults, again, could be really different. They could be different from what the, the young have. So, uh, for example, if we talk about the, some of the natural enemies, uh, some of the uh, things that eat other bugs, uh, when they turn into adult, they may switch and feed just on nectar and pollen, lady beetles, those are green lace ones. And shelter needs, um, not a whole lot of insects need shelter, but there are some examples, and, and one of the better ones would be uh, certain kinds of solitary bees that use cavities. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Too. Anyway, so go through a couple of these. So uh, in the beginning of all this whole idea about, you know, how do, how do you change landscapes for uh, certain kinds of insects, it's butterfly garden. I mean, that's, that's where it all started, uh, maybe 35, you know, 40 years, close to 40 years ago in the United States. Um, and people are really familiar with this. So, but anyway, it, it uh, it's how uh, butterfly gardening is what got me thinking about this whole idea. And, and my gateway bug, I call it, uh, was one that I used to see in my yard called the parsley worm, a really pretty caterpillar. It would lay its eggs on parsley and dill. And uh, when it's a young stage caterpillar, like in the upper left there, it uh, kind of looks like a little, little bird dropping a bit. When it's too big to get away with looking like a bird dropping, uh, it becomes brightly colored. And, it's a banded, and uh, um, it's a it's a good looking caterpillar, um, and it eats a lot of parsley and dill sometimes. But uh, you know how much parsley, dill, and and particularly fennel, the other thing they they feed on. How much do you need? Just plant more, um, and uh, we'll get more of these. I've always thought. I mean, when my kids were young, uh, I could I could say you know they're they're bored in the summer. I mean, go out. I saw some parsley worms in the backyard, and they'd go out because. They're interesting to find. Uh, and an interesting thing with these and some other kinds of caterpillars is when you hassle them, boop, these smelly little horns come off the front of their head. Um, and that's kind of in interesting, interactive. Not too many insects do that. And it's got kind of an odd odor. And kids kind of like to check that out too. Anyway, when, I, when the kids you know, were done with them, I'd say, eh, you know, let them go after you're done hassling them. And, and uh, they'd go on their way and uh, continue to develop. And ultimately, they would find some little corner in the garden and settle and uh, wrap themselves up to transition to the pupa. The pupa of this is a butterfly, so it's going to be what's called a chrysalis. And then ultimately, the adult form of that parsley worm becomes a butterfly, a very good looking butterfly uh, called the black swallowtail. So this gets into butterfly gardening and, and the, the principles are really sim uh, simple. Um, and I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with them. But the, the main thing is uh, you want to provide food for the adults. Uh, and then uh, to really step it up, you want to provide food needs for the larvae that produce those adults. Obviously avoid using harmful insecticides. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna talk a little about this mud puddling habit uh, uh, as well. So what do the adults need? I mean, adult butterflies, they're mostly feeding on nectar. Uh, we see them at flowers. So um, there are certain kinds of flowers that are good butterfly flower. 
flowers. And in your area, you might have a different group of flowers that are more appropriate. These are the ones that are the ones that in my yard, I'm in Fort Collins, uh, that I see them on all the time. So these are my favorites. But but again, you want to adapt it for plants that are, are appropriate in your area. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So there's annual plants. Um, uh, like you know, the larkspur has been my favorite this summer. Um, and then there's some perennial plants and the uh, red valerian has been really good and the thistles have been really good in my yard this summer and the monarda too. Anyway, in your own area, you know, there, there's lists of butterfly plants. Now, if what you're interested in is attracting them to feed at your garden for nectar, mass plantings uh, are, are important uh, to make it more attractive. If you just have a few flowers, uh, they may stop by and visit. But if you have a mass of them, more more likely to stop. And and that's what people want to do. They want they want to see the butterflies in their garden. So for providing uh, nectar, uh, plant plant several of them, or plant at least a plant that has lots of flowers, like a butterfly bush or some of these asters. Now, not all butterflies uh, are going to feed on nectar, uh, or maybe only partially on nectar. I, I, some of them are going to feed on other things, uh, fruit juices, oozing sap and the like. So for instance, uh, here's a couple of uh, uh, pictures of some uh, butterflies in a group called the, the brush-footed butterflies. Pretty big butterflies. Uh, some of them are pretty uh, obvious and, and kind of attractive, but many of them would rather feed on certain kinds of other fluids, again, from oozing plants or uh, uh, overripe fruit. I mean, here's a hackberry butterfly that's sucking the fluids off a dead raccoon in Oklahoma uh, from a couple of years ago. And there's uh, some variegated fritillaries that I see were feeding uh, on the fluids coming off a, a mountain lion dropping. Now, now, I'm not saying in your parks you should have a lot of dead raccoons and mountain lions around, uh, but the, the things you could do is, you know, maybe have uh, some areas where there's some overripe fruit or uh, you could make mixtures. If you've gone to a butterfly house, you'll often see them uh, have little stations there, often with um, overripe fruit as, as, a, as another kind of food source for them. Um, this mud puddling is another aspect. Now, sometimes you, you probably have seen butterflies on the soil, maybe in a large group, uh, and it's a it's a bit of damp soil. And and that's called mud puddling. And mud puddling is something only male butterflies do. Presumably they're picking up salts, but sometimes, you know, there's, there's a lot of them. Uh, and um, so sometimes uh, uh, maybe having a little damp spot uh, somewhere in that landscape as a, to have a mud puddle club uh, might be something you might want to add as part of a feature here. Now, to me, butterfly gardening, the real, uh, thing in butterfly gardening is not just planting flowers for the adults, is you want to build up the numbers of that kind of butterfly. And you do that by providing the kind of food that the caterpillars eat. So uh, all butterflies, that is a caterpillar on something. And there's, how you figure out what those would be is you look at local resources. So here's a fact sheet we've had on tracking butterflies in Colorado since the early 1980s and, and talks about the local butterflies that we have and what they feed on as a caterpillar food. But you go somewhere else, you know, at Texas or California or Arkansas, you, you, you can find similar resources. What you need to know is what are your butterflies, what's coming through your park, and uh, then adjust the plantings to support the caterpillars for those butterflies, if that's your interest here. Uh, and if you want uh, a really good source of information uh, that kind of covers the whole country, um, there's a website, Butterflies and, and Moss of North America. And this has, this has good information on where different species occur, even down to county level uh, checklists of species. And uh, also talks about things like what the caterpillars feed on. Anyway, so you have to do a little research to figure out what kind of plants uh, would be best in your parks depending on what kind of butterflies you've got. Um, so, so for instance, a two-tailed swallowtail is a, is a really common butterfly in our area. This is, this is um, uh, something that feeds on green ash, choke cherry, and hop. Uh, uh, 
uh, variegated fritillary. This is one that we see on, on visit pansies, visit flax, um, a couple other kinds of plants too. Uh, the uh, common buckeye, more snapdragons, toad flax, and plantain. Uh, Arizona sister on oak, legumes for the Melissa blue, whatever. I mean, the, the idea is you, you, you've you got to figure out what your butterflies are and, and then give them something to develop on when they're growing up. And then there's the monarch, of course, the, the Elvis of the uh, insect world, we call it. It's the most uh, charismatic of them all. And uh, let's talk a little bit about this. I mean, monarchs uh, are a, an insect that has got a lot of interesting angles to them. Uh, they are a migratory species. All of them right now uh, are in uh, the U.S. and, and their northern part of the range. But uh, six months from now, they'll uh, all be down in Mexico, at least the ones uh, east of the Rocky Mountains. Um, they develop, the caterpillars develop on milkweeds, and some milkweeds are, are very good uh, for supporting the caterpillars. Tuberosa, Incarnata uh, would be two that are, are good hosts. Uh, 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 Sirica and uh, Cursavica uh, would be good, good, good kinds of milkweeds. There's lots of milkweeds. These are, these are ones that are particularly good species for them. Now, one, there have been some interesting, there's interesting studies were just uh, published by a guy named Adam Baker out of Kentucky on how to, how to set up a garden to, he's just focusing on monarchs, set up a garden so that they'll lay more eggs on your garden. I mean, how do you structure a garden uh, to get a more uh, egg laying on it? So, so in, in, in the work he was doing, he pointed out some gardens are structured and some gardens he'd call non-structured, where they're kind of mixed and uh, shading each other. And uh, I think you can see some milkweeds there in the back uh, in this picture and, and also some in the front. So one of the things he, he looked at is how obvious is the plant in your garden? I mean, you could have a, have a plant by itself or you could have one that was kind of covered by some uh, uh, other kinds of vegetation. And does that make it um, uh, more or less likely to have eggs laid on it? And the results were, yes, the, the more accessible, the more obvious they are, a single uh, milkweed plant by itself had far more eggs uh, laid on it than, than milkweed that was covered uh, or surrounded by grass in this case. Uh, so, so you want them right out in front. Um, and uh, we, we talk about, a, you know, polyculture and, and uh, how a diversifying, first of all, planting can be useful for helping reduce a lot of problems and uh, with insects and, and making a more stable system. But in this case, we don't want a polyculture. We, we want it to be easy for them to find their plants. And then one other th uh, uh, experiment that he did that I thought was interesting, and there was a whole lot in that paper that I uh, showed in the beginning, was he, he did different plantings where he had the, the milkweed, which are in these M boxes, either on the outside of a planting and the inside of a planting, uh, grouped or scattered and then look to see how many eggs were laid uh, in these gardens. And what he saw is if, if you put the milkweeds, in this case, uh, along the outside, you get two to two and a half to four times more eggs being laid on it. So if th this same principle could be applied to pretty much any kind of butterfly. Uh, it can be done with mil uh, monarchs, but if there's some other butterfly you have in your parks that you want to lay more eggs, make it obvious. Uh, where the plants are so they can find it more easily. And uh, you should get more, more young. Now, um, I just have to say one thing about monarchs um, is that uh, this is a migratory species and some parts of the country are major, right in the middle of the flight path. Uh, you'll see these a lot every year. Uh, I used to be living in Minnesota. They were, you know, that was part of the flight path there, but. Now I'm in Colorado and everybody wants to do something for monarchs. And I hate to say it, but if you live in Colorado, you live in New Mexico, I mean, we're not players. Um, yeah, Texas, you're a player. Uh, uh, Arkansas, yes. Uh, and California, you have your own issues with monarchs over there too. But anyway, um, it doesn't matter how much milk we plant here in Colorado, 
there's not very many monarchs here. I mean, say if you want to do something for a monarch, go go live in Iowa. Anyway, and one last thing I want to say about butterflies is this idea of butterfly houses. I don't get this. There are these, these cute little butterfly houses that have little have little uh, openings, and presumably the idea is that they're supposed to go into these boxes and and rest in there. I know nobody who has ever seen a butterfly up in a butterfly house. I mean, do they provide benefits? <sighs> really dubious, really dubious. And, and you know, there's another issue uh, that, that comes up when you have something like this uh, out in your, in your garden, in your butterfly garden. And that is that there are things that eat caterpillars, in particular paper wasps. And in my area, we have in particular this paper wasp. If you're in Texas, you've got a, a different one. But paper wasps make these nests of paper and they raise their young on bug burger, particularly caterpillars. And, and uh, so, I mean, that's, they, they go and search and, and chew them up and turn them into paste and that's what they feed their young. They're fantastic for eating caterpillars, but we're talking about butterfly gardens right here. And so we don't want the caterpillars uh, massacred. So, <laughs> The primary effect of a butterfly house in, in your garden, in your park or whatever, is it will allow the paper wasps to more easily slaughter all the caterpillars in your butterfly garden. They'll move into this. They, they, they love those little cavities. So let's stick a fork in the idea of a butterfly house. It never made sense. And uh, if anything, it probably uh, causes more problems with you trying to establish a good, healthy population. So anyway. A different kind of, of, of uh, uh, insect that I want to move into now are what we call hummingbird moths. And this is a this is a kind of moth that is usually pretty big and flies during the day. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. Uh, and sometimes they look a lot like a hummingbird. Um, and these can be kind of magic uh, little moths, I think. Um, so a little background, a, a hummingbird moth, uh, when it's young, is a hornworm. A kind of caterpillar called a hornworm. Um, this gets a little complicated, but I think it's explained in your handout pretty well. Um, anyway, hornworms are the young stage of, of moths that are in a family called sphingidae, the sphinx moths. Okay, now a hornworm is a caterpillar that usually has a horn on the hind end, and, and many of you probably heard of hornworms. Uh, two are very famous because uh, they get in tomatoes, but tomato hornworm, uh, tobacco hornworm, these are in your tomatoes uh, and nightshade family plants. They're, you might have sweet potato, might one of the sweet potatoes. Uh, there's a sweet potato hornworm. And then there's tons of them on trees. Uh, and in our state, we get about two dozen kinds of hornworms and most of are up in trees. Nobody notices them. Nobody cares about them. They're not a pest. Um, and uh, they all, hornworms, turn into these moths we call sphinx moths. Okay, now sphinx moth is a pretty big moth. It comes from a pretty big caterpillar. Um, and uh, hornworms turn into sphinx moths. Now, normally, people aren't going to see sphinx moths because almost all of them fly at night. Um, and they might be visiting flowers that uh, only open at night. Um, and some flowers are, in, are are pollinated only by sphinx moths. But, but most people don't see the adult stage of most sphinx moths because they're flying at night. There are a couple, a small number, uh, that fly during the day. And if you have a sphinx moth that flies during the day so people can see it, they call it a hummingbird moth. Um, or at least around here. I'm not sure if that's a, a common um, term uh, in, in some of the other areas where, where you all live, but around here we call it a hummingbird moth. Flying during the day, they look like a hummingbird. They're about the same size, feeding at the same kind of plants, and, and really, I, I think, pretty magic. Uh, the most common of these is, uh, is an insect called the white line sphinx, and this occurs coast to coast. Um, it's got a strong white bar. It flies at night, but it also flies often during the daytime, more often at dusk, but, but when people could see it. Um, so here's uh, here's one uh, on my uh, valerian a, a couple weeks ago, right here. Um, just kind of funny, interesting moth. 
Um, so, so this moth, uh, when it's a caterpillar, obviously feeds on plants, but the kind of plants it feeds on are usually nothing we care about. It, it mostly it's weeds. They're eating, they're eating the purslane. I mean, gosh, that's one of my worst weeds in my garden. Go have it. Uh, um, if you're growing primrose, uh, yeah, evening primrose, then, then they might feed on that too, but not, not really a, a pest. It's just feeding on things we normally don't care about. And then there's another group of really interesting looking uh, sphinx moths that are called the bumblebee clear wing sphinx moths because these look like bumblebees. Uh, and here's, a, here's one uh, that I had uh, again in the, in the garden just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but just you know, these anyway, just interesting looking insects. Um, so if we wanted to plant a garden for attracting hummingbird moss, they go for a different palette of plants than, than a butterfly often would go to. They like, they've got mouth parts that are way longer and, and can reach deeply into a plant. So, so some plants such as honeysuckle, for instance, uh, may not be visited by butterflies, but they, uh, hummingbird moss will go for these. So this is a, this is a list of uh, some of the kinds of plants that grow around here that are really good if you wanted to have a garden for hummingbird moths rather than butterflies. Now, another moving on to another topic, landscaping for biological control agents. So, so what we're talking about here are things that eat other bugs. And uh, these biocontrols, these are perceived as being uh, beneficial kinds of animals. Um, and uh, the principles of, of gardening in a way to enhance these kinds of insects is I start with learn to recognize them and don't kill them. And I'll talk about that a little bit. But what are the food, what do the adults need? What do the young need? They meet, might feed on different things. And some of them have nest sites that they might, uh, might need. So the first thing I, 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 I point out with uh, gardening for natural enemies is, is learn to recognize them and, and, and don't kill them because you don't recognize them. And um, the example I, I use you know, for this is lady beetles. I mean, everybody knows what a lady beetle is in the adult stage, you know, and, and we have a lot. We've got 80 species in Colorado. I think there's about 400 in North America, but you know, they're, the adults are, are recognizable insects. Call them a ladybug, call them a ladybird, whatever. Yeah, you know, lady beetle, everybody knows what lady beetle is in the adult stage. But insects like beetles have what are called complete metamorphosis. So they look really different when they're uh, in different stages of their life. So uh, there's lady beetle adults uh, mating pair. There's, a, there's a eggs, they lay their eggs in a mass. And then the larvae, the larvae are totally different. And that's the eating machine. When they're done, they pupate. So, um, so we get lady beetles laying eggs, uh, masses of eggs near sources of their, their food. So these are the lady beetle eggs. You've never seen those. There's not too much that looks like them. And then the uh, young stage of lady beetles looks totally different. And, and uh, uh, many people, when they see them uh, walking around, they go, what the heck? I mean, is that looks like some sort of pest. So here we see one cruising around on a plant uh, not sure what kind of plant this is. And if I did, I couldn't talk about it with you guys anyway right now. But anyway, there it is, uh, uh, cruising for aphids there. Okay, so learn to recognize these is the main point I wanna have here. But then what do the adults need? I mean, a larva of a lady beetle eats tons of insects. But does the adult eat much? Uh, many insects, no, they don't. Um, and often they will just, sustain themselves on nectar and, and pollen. Uh, they don't need to feed on any bugs. Um, and, and, and this will be a repeating theme, a lot of the natural enemies, they like nectar and pollen to keep them going. So another kind of uh, natural enemy would be the green lacewings, a very well-known group um, that has a green body and lacy wings. And then the young stage is a, is a super predator, um, uh, eats pretty much anything it wants to. Um, but the adult stage, many of them don't feed it on anything other than nectar and pollen. So what you want to sustain them and keep them in an area is nectar and pollen sources. I mean, I'll just, again, flower flies, a group of uh, flies that many people have seen, but not 
uh, maybe recognized because they look like bees. Um, the uh, flower fly larvae feed on aphids, super aphid predator. The adults, they sustain themselves on nectar. Um, uh, and uh, many of these predators use flowers for nectar. Uh, some of them use it for pollen as well. And there are also other natural enemies we can talk about. There's little wasps that attack other insects. They lay their eggs in at the parasitoid. Uh, uh, and they are sometimes important natural enemies. Uh, another one is a group of flies that lays their eggs on an insect and then the young consumes the, the insect. Very important natural enemies. And, and these, in order for them to be efficient, they need food as the adults. Otherwise, they won't live as long. They certainly won't be in your area. So we enhance the landscape for this. And, and, and as an example, one thing we're pushing right now, and, and most of you don't have Japanese beetle, um, probably none of you do, but Japanese beetle is huge right now in, in Denver and uh, Boulder right now. We, we're the first Western state to get this and, and no other insect is causing more problems in terms of landscapes than this is. So we're trying to introduce some natural enemies to you know, bring, attack it in the East to bring it into Colorado. And one of them is a fly that, that lays its eggs, glues its eggs. I think you can see those white eggs on the picture on the left. Glues its eggs on the body of a Japanese beetle. And then the um, egg hatches and the young stage of the fly goes in and kills the Japanese beetles. So we're trying to introduce those here. Um, and uh, the limiting thing is that the only places that this fly does well is if there are lots of nectar sources nearby when the adults are out. Otherwise, it doesn't live very long. And the time this fly is out is late June and July. So the only places we're releasing them is places where there's flowers in late June and July. And they have to be certain kinds of flowers. Now, these kinds of insects, they don't have long mouth parts. They got little short mouth parts. And they um, can only reach and access flowers that are small, uh, little tiny flowers that you can get the nectar out of them. Uh, and the kinds of things we're talking about here are uh, anything in the carrot family. Oh, those are awesome for supporting these natural enemies. Uh, dill, fennel, coriander, ammy, queen anne's lace, some of the sedums, some of the spurges, sweet alyssum, basket of gold, many of the little, little flowered uh, kind of herbs like thyme, these would be really good plants to support these kind of insects. This is a different palette of plants than what you'd have for a hummingbird moth or, or a butterfly. And my two favorites, I mean, I just, I, you know, I, I love moon carrot and ammy. I mean, they can be, there can be so much insect action on those kinds of plants, uh, not just uh, 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 natural enemies, but some, some uh, uh, bees as well will visit these plants. Anyway. So a different way to plant. In this case, planting for natural enemies. Food needs for the young, uh, this gets a little more problematic because the young stage of a predator, a lady beetle being a predator of insects, feeds on insects. So how do you reconcile that? You gotta have food, you have to have bugs. And the way you do it is you tolerate kinds of insects that aren't really harming the plant. Uh, so, my example in my yard uh, that I see every year is uh, aphids on my spirea, my bridal root spirea. Now, there's aphids that cause problems, uh, yes, uh, but there's a lot of aphids that don't really cause problems. These, these show up on my, my shrub. Most people wouldn't even notice them. They grow like a weed anyway. Um, and what, what happens is, is th these aphids are, are serving as a food source for the lady beetles and the lace wings and all these other natural enemies early in the year. They kind of prime the biological control pump in my backyard. So because I've got these aphids, then I can get the, um, then I can get the uh, natural enemies building up on these aphids. And then I can have more of them in my, in my yard, in the landscape, because I'm tolerating ones that are not damaging. And then they can feed on some of the aphids that do cause a problem for me. It'd be different everywhere you go, but my aphids are an issue on, on roses and uh, aspen. 
Um, you know, another one I, I noticed uh, not too long ago was uh, some aphids on rubber rabbit brush. I didn't even know we had aphids on rubber rabbit brush until I saw these lady beetle larvae crawling all over it, eating them. The plants are fine. I mean, they, they tolerate it perfectly well. No, no. So what I'm just saying here is, is it's kind of a, a little counterintuitive, but, but these are good aphids. These are, these are aphids I want. So you may want to just keep the idea of maybe tolerating or maybe even having some plants that, that allow the growth of certain non-damaging species to help the natural enemies uh, build up in your, in your planting, in your park, in, your, in the neighborhood. So yeah, this would be some kind of habitat diversification. And one of the best books on this, and a, and a source that I, I think you should check, is um, done by the Xerces Society. Uh, this is a Society for Conservation of uh, Invertebrates. And they do fantastic publications, and most of them uh, are free. Uh, this book here is not, but this is an excellent book on how to improve habitat for these natural enemies. And if you ever want to search on this, this idea of improving habitat for natural enemies, conservation biological controls. That's what you want to go for. Nest sites, um, not so important for uh, uh, these, but uh, uh, there are some interesting kinds of wasps uh, that have a different habit uh, that we call hunting wasps. And we, these, are, these are wasps that are actually a lot of species, um, but they don't get nearly as much attention as others. And what a hunting wasp does is the mother hunts some kind of insect and, or spider, um, and paralyzes it and then takes it back to some sort of nest hole and intact. So the mother usually prepares some sort of nest cell for rearing young. Then she goes out and hunts something, paralyzes it and returns it to the cell. And then the larva of the hunting wasp eats that paralyzed insect that's in that cell. Um, it's kind of gruesome, but uh, also really pretty cool. So, for instance, one of the very first ones I ever saw, I was out camping once, and, and there was this, this wasp that had, uh, was in the ground, long skinny wasp, and was actually filling in a hole, just putting a couple little, little uh, pebbles in the, in the entrance, and then went away. And then 15, 20 minutes later, it comes back, that picture in the lower left, trundling this, this big caterpillar, this big naked hornworm caterpillar got off the uh, choke cherry. Uh, it's paralyzed. It comes back to the burrow. It opened up the burrow and then tucked that caterpillar down somewhere underground. So there's a little chamber, I'm sure it had prepared already, and then uh, laid an egg on it and then sealed that chamber. Uh, and the young would consume that caterpillar. And then the mother would do it again and again and get more and more caterpillars. Uh, this is this is one uh, that nests in sandy areas. And the, the, the sand wasp, they tend to go after um, after uh, flies, and they will have a hole in the ground, and they'll pack it full of flies. It could be a, it could be deer flies, it could be horse flies. They hunt them, and when they've got enough to support one young, they lay their eggs on it. This is this is one that goes after caterpillar, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, after katydids or, or grasshoppers. Uh, that's a pretty big one, and and the biggest of them all are what we call these cicada killers. I mean, these will make a nest maybe 16 inches down the ground, you'll see a big mound of soil. And then they go out and hunt cicadas, these, the, particularly these big cicadas that are up in the trees going And then they, they hunt them, they paralyze them, and they try to take them back. These are, these are pretty scary looking wasps. And I, I can't tell you how many have been sent in this year as, as the murder wasp, which don't get me started on that whole thing. Anyway, but Cicada killers, they kind of look like giant mutant yellow jackets from hell, but most of us, uh, most of you, I think have one or one or more of the cicada killers that occur in North America. This is the Eastern cicada killer. There's a Pacific cicada killer as well. We have the Eastern and the Western here in Colorado. And then, you know, just in another example, and, and I, I hope this is okay, enough time for this, but, but here's another, this is one that goes after stinky bugs. It nests in sandy soil, goes after stinky bugs. So stinky bugs are things like stink bugs. And uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, anyway, some other insects that are stinky or leaf-footed bugs. So here's, here's a situation where, where these uh, were shown, it was, a, it was a playground 
and the and and what what was the issue here was that at certain times, beginning in early July, all these wasps would emerge and they'd be zipping around the, the playground. And this, of course, caused a lot of concern. Well, this is one of these ground nesting wasps. So the, the wasps make little holes in the ground about seven inches down with that little L. And then they go out and hunt. Um, and they will then hunt uh, certain kinds of stinky bugs and then catch them and then uh, bring them back to this, this hole. So here's one, I think you can see it's got a, a paralyzed uh, called leaf footed bug here. So she comes back, she finds the entrance she had covered up and she'll dig it back out and then take that prey down in there. And these are the kinds of things that are down underground. Now these are, these are wasps, these, these, these hunting wasps, although they have the name wasp associated with them, are, these are not aggressive. For you to get stung by any of these, you would have to grab them and put them on your skin. I mean, they'll, they'll leave you alone. But, you know, I realize that having, having little wasps flying around the, the playground is not, uh, uh, most, most uh, parents don't, don't like that if their, their kids are playing on the playground. But that site where I showed you happened to have sand that was just the right consistency and just the right moisture, and it was a perfect place for them to, to nest in. Other uh, of these wasps will nest in little cavities. So you have you know, pruning cut or something like that. They'll go in and they will excavate the pith. Uh, so little ones uh, are usually wasps that go out and hunt uh, things like aphids or leaf hoppers, which are little kinds of insects. Um, and, and one thing I'll do every year is, is when I'm pruning my yard, I'll, I'll take the pithy plants, you know, like the raspberries and the roses and the butterfly bush and for my prunings, and I'll just stick them around in the garden and then see what goes in them. And every one of these gets uh, occupied by some little uh, wasp that is uh, hunting things in my yard. Um, and some will use existing cavities. So uh, I'll come back to this, the idea of, of providing uh, uh, nest sites uh, and, and some of them go out and, and they'll use these holes in a tr drilled block of wood or something like that. Or in nature, they might use an old bore hole or something like that. So in this case, it happens to be uh, by the wasp that hunts tree crickets shown there in the lower right and then catches them and, and puts them in a little cavity and then stuffs the cavity with uh, bits of grass. Anyway, there's lots of examples for that. Then finally, landscaping and bees. Um, so this is obviously a big issue, uh, pollinators in general, but mostly people are talking about bees. Uh, and bees, uh, essentially all bees rear their young on nectar and pollen. They can have a hairy body. Some of them make wax, some of them don't, some of them sting. Uh, but the ones that are solitary bees the ones that don't make a colony, and I'll come to those in a second, they're extremely non-aggressive, and have a very mild sting, if uh, uh, maybe a mild pinprick, uh, and you would have to place them on your skin to get them to sting you. So there are lots of kinds of bees. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe Texas, you've got more, but uh, you know, how many species of bees are known to occur just in our state here in Colorado? Uh, 946, um, that's how many bees are known from the state. Uh, and most of them are natives. Um, and a well-planned garden can help various species of bees by expanding, uh, you, by expanding use of, of high value flowering plants that these bees use. And one of them would be the honeybee. I mean, that's what everybody talks about when they're thinking bees, but the honeybee you may not know it, but it's not native to North America. We, we brought it over in 1622, I think. Came out to Colorado, mid 1800s, 1860 sometime. Anyway, but it's a very important bee if you want to grow agricultural crops that originated from Asia and uh, Europe where the honeybee is native. And, and many of our crops uh, we grow are, are not from North America, they're from Europe and Asia most all of our fruit crops. Um, anyway, and it's also produces honey. So what do we do about gardening in ways to support a honeybee? Well, you know, again, honeybees and most bees, they're rearing their young uh, on foods they collect from flowers. And nectar is going to be the source of sugar 
Uh, and if they have excess nectar, they convert it to honey. And then pollen provides pretty much everything else. It provides the protein, it provides the vitamins, it provides the fats. And, and bees will uh, carry this, this uh, the pollen back with them in various ways. A honeybee and a bumblebee, they've got little pollen sacks on their, on their uh, hind legs, kind of little saddlebags. Others might carry it on their belly or on upper part of their leg. But uh, so, so if we are going to garden for, for, for bees, for honeybees, uh, we want to provide high quality sources of nectar. We want to provide high quality sources of pollen and provide a nesting site. And this goes for pretty much all bees. Nesting sites for honeybees, well, you wouldn't be involved. I mean, most all honeybees in urban areas anyway are going to be uh, in, a, in a hive that a beekeeper maintains. Uh, the, the wild site for a honeybee would be a hollow tree. And you know, if you have some hollow trees, that might be uh, where a, a feral wild honeybees have been nested. But anyway, you're not gonna be able to do much for nesting sites. But flowers for nectar and pollen. So there are various kinds of flowers that are really good for honeybees. These are the ones that are really good uh, here in Fort Collins. But you know, if you're in Texas, you got another list of plants that would be really good. And you can find these in uh, you know, various publications that are put out by universities or other uh, local universities or other um, groups that are interested in uh, supporting the, the bees that you find in your state. Anyway, but you know, some of the ones in my yard that I really like are catmint, uh, salvia, and New England aster. But, all right, I mean, everybody, you know, understands, you know, pollen and nectar, that's what bees like. But the, but the thing I think that's more important, uh, that, that isn't, it's also important anyway, that, that people don't give enough attention to is, is that when you're selecting these plants, you want to have plants that are available throughout the entire period when the bees need them. I mean, honeybees are, are they're always active. They're, they've got a perennial nest. They, they might have, you know, 50,000 individuals in midsummer. And, and they survive through winter on stored food, more so the further north you get. Uh, and uh, and they, they need pollen and nectar throughout the year, uh, particularly pollen. I mean, pollen, they, they only, they don't keep that for very long. So, so big thing is, is plant plants that not only are used, but plant plants that are going to be available early in the year and late in the year and in the middle of the year. Don't just say it's a bee plant. I want a bee plant that is, is particularly early in the year. So uh, you know, that's a real tough time where we are, is early in the season, they have gone through winter working on the stored food that they have, and, and they might be running out of food by the end of, end of summer, excuse me, end of, end of winter. And, and the things that are out early are really important to, to allow uh, honeybees to get through winter, in, at least where I'm living. It'd be di different in Texas, of course. Um, so one thing, bulbs, oh my gosh. I mean, I, I push plant bulbs. I mean, that's, that's the first thing many of these are, uh, bees are visiting because uh, they're coming up very early. And, and some trees, even though they might be wind pollinated, are, are extremely heavily used. Maples, uh, something like 90% of the pollen that is collected by bees in our urban areas here in this part of the state for the first three or four weeks they're out is from maples. That's, it could be soft maples, like a silver maple or a um, Norway maple also after that, silver maple, super important. Red maples, excuse me, also too. And then late in the season, there's different kinds of plants you'd want to have out. And one other thing is lawns. I mean, I don't know if you can fit this in, but there are flowers in lawns. There you know, could be dandelions, there could be sweet clover, could be violets. These, these are pollen sources. These can be important pollen sources. I don't know if you can tolerate in your gar in your in your parks, but boy, I mean that's a under-recognized uh, potential area where we could really improve pollinator habitat. Uh, the group in Kentucky uh, did some work on this, just finding all the kinds of uh, bees that were visiting dandelions and white clover in an urban suburban lawn, and you know over 50 species are using these these weeds that. Well, we call them weeds. Anyway, probably not going to 
convince you to, to keep some dandelions and white clover around, but they are uh, potentially very useful. Now, some discretion should be important when citing plants, how they favored by bees. I mean, I, I love this because this is my colleague's house. So here, here's the entrance. You can see where, where he lives and uh, he's got these flowering plants all over there. And uh, on the left, he's got a sedum and on the right, he's got a caryopteris. And these are two of the most bee magnet kinds of plants we have late in the season. And this is, they are just boiling around uh, these plants. And as a result, the postman doesn't want to deliver mail to this guy's house. <laughs> I mean, these well, bees that are out visiting flowers are happy, uh, so they're not going to sting you, but still, um, any, so use discretion. So there are ways you can plant uh, to have plants that bees don't go. I mean, you can still have flowers and not have bees visiting. So there's a lot of flowers that bees don't visit. Certainly any doubled flower cultivar. They got a really long corolla. Many common bedding plants we have are not good for bees. So yeah, if you want to not have bees, you can still have flowers. I mean, this is a, a planter box that I think you would never see a bee visiting because none of the flowers on that uh, in that planter box would be ones that bees visit. So anyway, it depends on what you want. But then there's other bees. Um, the uh, bumblebees. Now, the bumblebees are native to North America. We got about two dozen here in Colorado. Um, they are usually considerably bigger than a honeybee. And be a bumblebee there on the left. Uh, and they might have yellow. Most of them are yellow, but there's all sorts of difference in color. A lot around here, we have one star orange. That's a pretty common color for the, the locally abundant ones we have in Fort Collins here. And they are, act a little differently from a, a honeybee in that they don't have a colony all the time. Honeybees keep a hive going. They, even in the dead of winter, you know, they may be down to 10,000 individuals, but they're a colony altogether. That's unique. Bumblebees, the only thing that survives is a queen that is a female produced at the end of the previous year. And she hides somewhere and then starts a new colony the next year. So they make a brand new colony every year. So they hide, number one, they're hiding somewhere in the winter, and then in spring they come out. And the mother is doing all the work to try to raise the young. And uh, the young that she raised uh, are usually pretty small because they're not very well fed, but they get bigger and bigger. So this is a, this is a honey a bumblebee queen uh, that was the first bumblebee that I saw of this species in my yard uh, early in the spring. That's the one that overwintered. And then she raises some young eventually, it takes her about six weeks or so to get any young. And the, and the ones she rears are, are usually very tiny because they weren't well fed. So you see a range of size with bumblebees with them tending to get bigger as the year goes along. Anyway, so bumblebees nest somewhere and where bumblebees will nest, it doesn't really show it here, but it's some kind of cavity, some kind of cavity that's got some insulation. So this would be what a bumblebee nest looks like. Or here's a here's a bumblebee nest uh, uh, in action. You can see the queen in there. They make these little pots of wax and uh, don't make honey, but they store food temporarily in those. Where do they nest? Uh, bumblebees are usually nesting in, in some cavity that has got insulation, often an old rodent burrow. Uh, you know, um, could be in this case there's an old uh, birdhouse that got vacated, but it's a small colony. Uh, but they like some some kind of a uh, uh, insulation. Um, there are plans for, for producing uh, these uh, bumblebee hives. People, you can find this, this is pretty big in, in Britain, but uh, it, they often aren't very successful in getting bumblebees to nest there. Um, I don't know what you could do about providing nesting sites. I mean, one place where they would love to the nest around here, I've seen this, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, we used to have uh, all these uh, Couches get discarded, particularly when the students are are uh, uh, coming around, uh, which is happening now. Or yeah. anyway, and and they might be on a, a person's deck. Uh, uh, and anyway, these couches, there's a little tear in them. I mean, they the bumblebees will go right in there and they'll nest. And so I see the fraternities uh, often had these uh, 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 on the front deck. We don't do it anymore because every time we'd win a football game, the, the, the couches would come out on the street and people would burn them. But anyway, you have these, uh, these couches out there and uh, they are um, 
uh, that might be something you really would miss. Anyway, I'm not saying put ratty couches in your parks. Uh, there are nests, uh, there are bumblebee colonies that are sold, and that's because they are used for pollinating um, uh, certain kinds of crops like tomatoes. Anyway, certain kinds of plants are heavily visited by hum bumblebees, and these might include the same kind of plants as a honeybee, but bumblebees have longer mouth parts, they're a bigger bee, and there are plants that are particularly good for a bumblebee, and they might not be the same as a honeybee. And cultivar differences can be huge. I mean, you can say, oh, it's this kind of, uh, this agastache is, is what you want. Well, you know, it four agastaches out. Kudos silver blue, the honey, the bumblebees were over it, the painted lady butterflies were over it. You get the rosy posy, and yeah, about half as many. Then you get the ones that have got uh, um, kind of yellow colors, and there were no, almost no bumblebees using it. Same species, just different cultivars, different in flower color. But last is that the, the main, most kind of bees that we have are solitary bees. They don't make a nest. We got about 920 species of solitary bees in the state. And a solitary bee usually has one generation a year. Um, the, the mother does everything. She goes and collects, she makes a, a, a cell for her young. She goes and collects pollen and nectar, enough to survive, to, to support one young. And then she seals the cell and her young feeds on that plug of pollen and nectar. And then she does it again and again. Um, most solitary bees are ground nesters. Um, so they would uh, uh, nest in the soil. So there'd be some kind of tunnel. You might just see it as a little bit of diggings, but some kind of tunnel that goes into, into a, uh, chambers below ground that then are provisioned with nectar and pollen. Um, and there are different kinds of bees, digger bees, uh, and drenid bees, wet bees. So, so here's digger, you know, digger bees would be um, uh, one that is digs in the ground. They're usually fairly big, um, carry their pollen on the legs like that. Uh, here's, a, here's a site uh, uh, of digger bees. They're usually really specific about where they're going to nest. They like open areas, they like open soil. Uh, has to be the right aspect, has to be the right um, drainage and everything. And so this is one that's pretty dramatic uh, in an area in southern Colorado, but you see them all zipping around. Again, pretty scary looking, but these are these are harmless bees. I mean, again, you would have to grab them and, and a female and, and put the female on your skin to get the stung. And most of the things that are zipping around there are males, and males don't sting. Anyway, lots of little these bees. Uh, there's there's smaller ones, little ones that make tiny little holes. Uh, again, they like exposed soil though, or little cracks uh, underneath the rocks and the like to nest. The sweat bees, again, small bees that might nest in soil. You might see just a little bit of a digging with them. There's uh, one coming out of its little hole, and the the young that are in an area underneath the uh, underneath the soil. I'm almost done. I'm almost done here. I know you got to quit here, but um, so so one last thing I want to say about the uh, ground nesting bees is they need open soil, and very few, if any, will nest in a site that has thick mulch layer. So so um, I see things like this around town where we've got all this shredded bark mulch, and this is great for keeping down weeds, but this is not habitat for ground nesting bees. If that's what you want. Uh, you need to have some open soil. So here's a here's a site here. Uh, I love this because it was in a university. Here's their butterfly guard. Here's their pollinator habitat. They had the butterf they had those stupid butterfly houses, and then they had soil just covered with mulch. Um, the uh, you know, I mean, what's that's not pollinated habitat. I mean, it looks good, but it's not pollinator habitat. And then the last ones are ones that nest in above ground cavities. So one of these would be a leaf cutter bee. Another group would be mason bees. So these, these nest above ground and they need cavities. They may excavate them or if you provide them, they'll be nesting in those. This group of bees, you'll see them carrying their pollen on their belly, not on the legs. So here's one collecting pollen off of, on a flower. And the leaf cutter bees cut leaves. Um, so, so what they'll do, a uh, leaf cutter bee, is they will uh, first find some sort of suitable site to nest in. And this could be something that has an existing hole, a cavity, 
or they excavate one out of rotten wood. So here's some that have excavated some rotten wood. And here's a, a rotten board in my backyard where they're excavating. They make little tunnels and then they go and collect leaves to build a, a cell, a leaf lined cell, kind of like a little mini cigar butt that they'll rear their young in. So, so here's the bees that are out collecting these little fragments and, and uh, they cut the fragments from the edge. They make a nice little, nice smooth cut. Um, and then they uh, take it back. Certain kinds of flowers, uh, excuse me, certain kinds of leaves they'll use and others they'll avoid. It has to be just the right thickness and hairiness. Roses, lilac, Virginia creeper, redbud, these are all great ones for leaf cutter bees. They carry them back to the nest. They fashion these, these, these pieces of leaf fragments into these cells. In the lower right, you can see multiple cells. They kind of look like little, again, little mini cigar butts. And they're made up of multiple pieces of cut leaf. So, so when a, a, a nest cell, this is a good single cell, a nest cell is gonna be made of three to four pieces that are kind of cut rectangular, and then they crimp it at the base. Um, uh, the, uh, um, and then they build more oval pieces they'll cut to build up the sides. And then they go out and collect pollen and nectar to supply one cell. And uh, then they lay an egg. And then so the three or four rectangular pieces, oval pieces, and then circular pieces cap the cell. And then they do it again. So uh, they'll stay in that cell and, and we would come out the next year. The other one that's uh, big are mason bees. They don't cut leaves. Instead, they seal between the, the uh, cells uh, with mud, like a mason would do. So, so here's mason bees you, uh, plugging an area with mud uh, that has, has uh, many cells within it in pre-drilled wood. So again, little, little cells separated by, by mud. So one common thing that is really popular now is providing nest sites for these cavity nesters. And often this is either pre-drilled wood or, or uh, sometimes they'll put these uh, soap straw inserts in them. Um, typically these are holes about six to eight millimeters, a third of an inch, a quarter to a third of an inch. And this could be the most important thing for having these bees around. If there's, if there's not a place for them to nest, you're not going to have them. So sometimes providing these nest sites is important for, for building up their populations. So some kind of cavities, uh, drill wood, you know, again, around six to eight millimeters. Um, there's different configurations. You know, I'm sure some of you have seen things like this uh, and different hole sizes will be used by different kinds of, of bees. Uh, uh, um, so <laughs> But, but one last thing I want to say is, is that sometimes people get a little carried away uh, on this. They mean, oh, we're going to make a little of these, these beautiful, and they, they engineer these incredible things. And this is, this is actually not a good thing because it might be great habitat for them to nest in for a while, but there are things that then attack them. And so they've got parasites. You concentrate their parasites. It'd be far better to have lots of little nest sites all around than one big thing like this. So think social distancing. There are some great publications. I love this one. It's referenced in that handout from Utah, um, where the Center for uh, Native Bee Research is done uh, with the USDA. If you want one book on understanding bees and trying to identify them, this is the book. This is a great book. Um, bees are tough but get that book. Um, and if you want the idea of how to attract pollinators, there's tons of books on this uh, subject, but Xerxes Society, I think does it the best. Okay, so, sorry, I went over a little bit. Um, tried to cram in too many things. I think you just saw 200 slides. Um, I uh, have got my contact information in the bottom of this slide. And um, I don't know, got any questions? I don't. Uh, yeah, we actually do have, we do have two questions. When you were talking about the aphids, um, we had a person ask about aphids on aspens. Yeah, um, well, I mean, they, we've got a couple kinds of aphids on aspen around here and yeah, they, they build up and uh, um, I mean, uh, but that's a, 
I mean, that's an aphid question. I mean, how do I manage aphids? Uh, is, that a, uh, is that a good thing or is that something they should be spraying for? Well, I, I don't see them. I, I'm in, 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 I, I see them all the time and I, I don't think I've ever seen them hurt the tree. Um, sometimes they might cause the leaves, if they build up in high numbers late, they might cause the leaves to yellow a little prematurely, but no, the aphids, I mean, aphids, the way aphids feed is they've got mouth parts that can go, they, they, they precision drill to the phloem and they don't hurt the cells because they want to be able to tap into the phloem and just pull fluid out. And, and if they pull a lot of fluid out, if you have a lot of them for a long time, that's a stress, but they're not killing cells. There are other kinds of insects like a plant bug or a stink bug that kills cells and makes you know, damage. But aphids don't do a whole lot of damage unless they last a long time. And, and usually, you know, they don't because, you know, once they start to build up, then the cavalry arrives and then the lady beetles and the lace wings come. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Um, so Tara Jordan's asking that they have ground bees in a sandbox. I yes. have a playground. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's probably kind of like the situation that I talked about. I, so, yeah. I thought somebody might ask about that. So I, I don't really know, you know, what to tell you about this. So, so, so this is what, what, is going to have why they're nesting there is that 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 sand is just the right texture and surface and it, I don't know if you could change the the surface of it uh, they wouldn't nest I mean if you have finer sand or you know on, on top of that um, then then they wouldn't nest nest there um, but that's you know kind of changing the whole thing out in terms of insecticides there's absolutely zero value for this. I mean, obviously you don't want to use insecticides in a sandbox anyway. What I would suggest if you can is if you, you, you really don't want them there, at the end of the season, go through and dig dig it up if you can. And the, the, you will be uh, digging up the nest cells and probably only go down six inches and you get them all, but bring them up to the surface and that will kill the ones that are overwintering there so that then they won't come out the next year. But no, that's that's the best thing I can suggest for that. Yeah. Uh, Dig them up and change the change the course of the sand. Change the coarseness of the sand, yeah. yeah. And then um, we have somebody who's interested in the CSU Master Gardener class. Do you know where they can find information on that? Uh, county offices. Um, they, they usually the Master Gardener uh, program usually starts in Feb, uh, in January. Um, so yeah, depends on what county you are. Uh, go to the CSU Extension and, and uh, uh, ask for your your, your county. Uh, just, just as asked, they, um, not all counties have it. It depends on where you are in the state, but it, it's a great program. It's my favorite program to do. I love doing that. Cool. And then one more question about bees. Uh, would bees nest in engineered wood fiber? Oh, so what we're talking about is, all right, we don't use sand or feed. Um, I don't know. I don't think so. I. I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, there'd be a lot of glue in that too. Um, I think it's mostly weathered, weathered wood uh, that okay. they're going for. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't seen them in that, uh, uh, but I, I, I don't think they would. But you know, I could be wrong. Yeah. So, so what Eve is saying is that if they don't nest in injured, engineered wood fiber, that that might be an alternative. Um, to the sand in the playground for the person who was asking that question. Oh, engineered wood fiber for the for the playground. Oh yeah. Oh okay. I thought we we're talking about. Um, yeah, I was too there for a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh God, no. Yeah, no. I I don't think so. Um, yeah, like like, like the one at the playground right around the corner here. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I don't think. And and it's covered. I mean, it's yeah. No, no. The the sand has to be when they do it in sand, it's just got to be the right texture so it holds so they can dig in it yeah. and make yeah. a tunnel and no engineer no go, okay. go go with the end yeah go with that go with the engineer <laughs> sorry i misunderstood that that's okay that's all right i did too um okay so that seems to be all of the questions so a couple of things for thank you first of all um dr cranshaw for your time you are getting tons of comments in the section about um how much people learned they love looking at your slides it was all very interesting including for me um, so thank you very much those of you who have participated today you're going to get an another email from me with the evaluation on it 
I implore you to please do that when I send it to you immediately. It will take you less than five minutes. It's very self-explanatory, but we would love to have your feedback on all these Zoom classes that we're doing. Um, also, if you were on an iPhone or if you are Brittany Jensen or Daniel Leslie, I don't know who you are and if you're looking for CEUs, I need to know who you are. So if you can email me separately so I can make sure I got my roll count all good. And um, I wanna thank you all for joining us. And I will send out another email regarding our next session, which is not until August the 26th because I'm skipping next week, uh, but it will be on the solutions for sports lighting and it will be done by one of our sponsors, Musco Lighting. So if you wish to attend that, please email me and I will get you registered. Otherwise, thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you again to our sponsors. Thank you to Southwest Park and Recreation Training Institute, and we'll see you next time. So thank you again, Dr. Cranshaw. Okay, and this is recorded, right? This is recorded, and I do hope to put it up on our website, uh, hopefully by the end of the month. Okay, excellent, thank you. All right, okay. thank Bye. you guys. Bye, everybody. Yeah.